Hello and welcome to the next video in our series on linear algebra. In this video, we're going to extend the ideas of vector spaces to continuous functions and develop the concept of function spaces. We'll discover that all of the properties of vector spaces that we've previously discussed extend to function spaces. This includes the Gram-Schmidt process, which we will use to create sets of orthogonal polynomials. Imagine there is an interval i, then we can define a function space, which is a function of i, whose elements are real valued functions. This space satisfies all of the axioms of vector spaces, namely addition, f plus g of x is equal to f of x plus g of x, which is itself an element of f, scalar multiplication, a f of x is equal to a times f of x, which is also an element of f. The zero element of a function space is the constant function with value zero everywhere on the interval. An example of a function space is f, whose elements are the functions a0 plus a1 times x plus a2 times x squared, etc. through a n times x to the n. Note, we shouldn't confuse this with the set of degree n polynomials, since the sum of two degree n polynomials isn't necessarily a degree n polynomial. Instead, we call this the set of polynomials of degree less than or equal to m. Given a vector space v and a set s, we can extend the notion of function space from real-valued functions to the set of v-valued functions, where f is a map from the set s to the vector space v. These are vector spaces, since the axioms of vector spaces hold for them too. The most common example of this type of vector space is vector-valued functions. We see these all the time in physics and engineering. All of the properties of vector spaces that we we have previously discussed, span, bases, inner products, norms, and orthogonality, also apply to function spaces. The span of a set of elements, v1 through vk, of a function space f is the subset of f that consists of all possible linear combinations of the vi's. For example, the function space whose elements are a0 plus a1 times x plus a2 times x squared is spanned by f0 of x equals 1, f1 of x equals x, and f2 of x equals x squared. In general, you need n plus 1 functions, 1, x, x squared, through x to the n, to span the space of polynomials of degree less than or equal to n. This may seem trivial, but consider the space of all quadratic trigonometric functions. This can be spanned by 1, cosine x, sine x, cosine squared x, sine x times cosine x, and sine squared x. But as we'll see in a minute, it might be more useful to span it by 1, cosine x, sine x, cosine 2x, sine 2x. Note that all of the functions in the first spanning set can be produced from linear combinations of functions in the second spanning set using trig identities. Consider the homogeneous ordinary differential equation g equals u double prime minus 2u prime minus 3u equals 0. This has solutions f1 of x equals e to the minus x and f2 of x equals e to the 3x. Then any linear combination u of x equals a1 times f1 of x plus a2 times f2 of x is also a solution to g. Thus the function space of solutions to g is spanned by the two basic solutions f1 of x and f2 of x. A basis for f is a finite set of elements f1 of x through fn of x that a spans f and b is linearly independent. Let's have a look at the two spanning sets for the space of all quadratic trigonometric functions again. The first set is linearly dependent because a0 times 1 plus a1 times cosine x plus a2 times sine x plus a3 times cosine squared x plus a4 times sine of x times cosine x plus a5 times sine x squared is equal to zero when a3 plus a4 equals minus a0 equals c for any value of c. So this cannot be a basis. On the other hand, the second set is linearly independent, so it does form a basis. Inner products and norms on function spaces are some of the most important aspects of functional analysis. We'll use this concept extensively when we explore PDEs. Given a function space f consisting of all scalar-valued functions f on a closed bounded interval a through b, then the inner product of two continuous functions f and g in f is given by the integral from a to b of f of x times g of x dx. The associated L2 norm is given by the magnitude of f equals the square root of the integral from a to b of f of x squared dx. This is effectively an infinite dimensional analog of the Euclidean dot product. 
The other norms we discussed can also be extended to function spaces. The L1 norm equals the magnitude of the integral from a to b of f of x squared dx. The L infinity norm is equal to the max of the magnitude of f of x on the interval a to b. Inner products and norms can also be weighted by a continuous positive scalar function w of x. Then the weighted inner product is given by the integral from a to b of f of x times g of x times w of x dx. And the associated norm is given by the magnitude of x equals the square root of the integral from a to b of f of x squared times w of x dx. Likewise, the two functions f of x and g of x are then said to be orthogonal with respect to the weight function w if the weighted inner product is equal to zero. Note the standard L2 norm has constant weight function w of x equals one. For example, x and x squared are orthogonal with respect to the weight function w of x equals one on the interval minus one to one, since the integral of their product from minus one to one vanishes. Likewise, sine pi x and cosine pi x are orthogonal with respect to the weight function sine pi x squared on the interval from minus one to one, since the integral from minus one to one of sine pi x cubed times cosine pi x vanishes. How do we construct an orthogonal basis for the function space Pn of x of polynomials of degree less than or equal to n on the interval minus 1 to 1? We can do this by the Gram-Schmidt construction. Starting with a spanning set of elements w, the zeroth element of the orthogonal set v is v0 is equal to w0. Then the ith element of v is given by vi equals wi minus the sum from j equals 1 to i minus 1 of the inner product of wi with vj divided by the norm of vj squared times vj. The first construction we'll do is based on the L2 inner product, but in principle you could choose any weight function you'd like. These are useful for different purposes. Let's start with a basis for Pn given by the set 1, x, x squared, and so on through x to the n. This isn't an orthogonal basis because the integral from minus 1 to 1 of any even function that isn't the zero function is not equal to zero. The zeroth iteration is choosing the first function to normalize, so g0 of x equals 1, where the magnitude of g0 is the integral from minus 1 to 1 of g0 squared dx, which equals 2. The second polynomial is g1 of x equals x minus the inner product of x with g0 divided by the norm of g0 squared times g0, which ends up equaling x, with the magnitude of g1 equals two thirds. Then we iterate gk of x equals x to the k minus the sum from j equals 0 to k minus 1 of the inner product of xk with gj divided by the norm of gj squared times gj. This choice of interval and norm give us the Legendre polynomials pn of x. They've been standardized so that pn of 1 equals 1, p0 equals 1, p1 equals x, p2 equals 1 half times 3x squared minus 1, p3 equals 1 half times 5x cubed minus 3, p4 equals 1 eighth times 35x to the fourth minus 30x squared plus 3. It turns out that there are natural reasons for choosing a specific weight function or interval, but we'll get to that in the next few videos when we discuss eigenfunctions and Sturm-Liouville theory. Other families of orthogonal polynomials you might run into are the Hermite polynomials, which are orthogonal with respect to the Gaussian weight function e to the minus x squared. h0 equals 1, h1 equals 2x, h2 equals 4x squared minus 2, h3 equals 8x cubed minus 12x, h4 equals 16x to the fourth minus 48x squared plus 12. Chebyshev polynomials are orthogonal with weight function 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Chebyshev polynomials of the first kind are standardized so that tn of 1 equals 1, and Chebyshev polynomials of the second kind are standardized so that un of 1 equals n plus 1, and un of minus 1 equals minus 1 to the n times n plus 1. t0 equals 1, t1 equals x t2 equals 2x squared minus 1, t3 equals 4x cubed minus 3x, t4 equals 8x to the fourth minus 8x squared plus 1, u0 equals 1, u1 equals 2x, u2 equals 4x squared minus 1, u3 equals 8x cubed minus 4x, u4 equals 16x to the fourth minus 12x squared plus 1. 
Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.